Hey, yes, welcome back, everybody, once again to Tips from the Server Room. This is episode number 124 for March the 3rd, 2018. I'm your host, Jack. And once again, I'm going to be guiding you into, through, back out of the worlds of systems administration, network administration, and all fields of IT. Please check out our website at tipsfromtheserverroom.com where you can comment on these shows, and I wish that you will do that. If you have any questions or ideas for future shows, please email me at jackstechcorner at gmail.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter and as at Technoman. Don't forget, we're also doing the video edition of this show now. And the video edition can be found on YouTube at 42Technoman. 42Technoman. Please remember to like the videos. I do appreciate that when you do that. And don't forget to click the subscribe button because then every time the video comes out, obviously you will be notified. Folks, this week we got into some stuff here that sometimes um, I have to say I don't really like getting into. Um, well, the second part of the show uh, that I'm talking about here, I do like the second part a lot more than the first part. And what we are talking about today is, and I'm sure everybody out there <clears throat> gets into this uh, occasionally, once in a while, but it is actually disposing of old technology. Now, this happens over and over uh, many times to all of us out there. Uh, even if you're a consultant, you know, your client's going to say, well, look, um, I know you put in all the new PCs and uh, that's great and everything, but what are we going to do with all this old technology? What are you going to do with those old hard drives? And what are you going to do, uh, you know, with the equipment itself? And we don't always recommend that the client just take them to a local city mission or a, a Goodwill. Um, and Goodwill, I used to give a lot of stuff uh, from the schools to Goodwill. But then we found out the owner of Goodwill, the CEO, the owner, whoever that person is, uh, was making multi-million dollars a year off of uh, the equipment that we were giving to charity, right? We wanted to give it to a charity, so we gave it to Goodwill. They clean it up, and they are making a staggering amount of money on old technology. Uh, because let's face it, if you don't have a lot of money and you want a computer in your house, you know, where are you going to go to? Uh, you know, people will go to the Goodwill, and they'll look, and they'll be, you know, maybe a Pentium 3 or something, or even a Pentium 4, um, yeah, something on the shelf there that they, they, they like. And, um, you know, with a monitor, keyboard, a mouse, and they're buying the whole thing for 200 bucks, and they think, well, I'm getting a great deal. And they are. But the thing is, that technology was donated to Goodwill, and then they resold it. So anymore, we look at giving back now uh, in a school setting, or in maybe if you work in a nonprofit, giving back to the community. Uh, I think that's a great way to do this, is to uh, give back to the very people taxpayers to tax base that is buying the equipment for the school. Uh, it works out really, really well for us. But what happens if you're a for-profit company? What do you do with your old technology? Well, there's a couple different things you can do with it. Uh, the first thing I would recommend to do is uh, you could either zero out the hard drives. And if you do a Google search, you'll find some great software. We found some software in the past. Because even though we give the computers back out to the community, we cannot give the software away, right? Because the software is licensed to the school through Microsoft. So we can't give that software out to the public. Uh, it just wouldn't be the right thing to do under the licensing agreement. So we normally recommend that they load some form of uh, Linux on it or uh, like, um, I think the last time I was telling people to load um, uh, Linux Mint or is it Mint Linux? But uh, it's a great little operating system. It works well. It has all the tools that they're going to need. And, you know, it's pretty much virus-free. Uh, so it works pretty well. But if not, if you're not going to zero those hard drives out, what you want to do, and if you're a for-profit company or if you're working for a, a doctor's office, if that's one of your clients, uh, maybe a doctor's office is a client of yours, what I would recommend to do is, and we used to do this a lot, Take the hard drives out of the towers, take them and run them through a drill press. And we used to drill press, we used to have like a two inch bit and we would put at least, you know, five holes through those discs, just drill right through the top of the case. Um, then you're fairly safe, 
uh, at least in my eyes, to, uh, to dispose of that hard drive and nobody's going to get your data. You wouldn't want somebody out there getting uh, credit card information from your clients. Uh, you wouldn't even want somebody out there getting, if you're in sales, you don't want them getting your contact lists. Uh, I think that's a, a big thing that you don't want getting out there. Uh, maybe a competitor is going to look at your contact list. And, you know, if you're a doctor's office, we don't want patient information getting out. And today it's a lot better. Um, there's a lot of online programs that uh, the current doctor's offices around here are using where everything's stored in the cloud-based uh, servers that host the software that was created for the doctors or for the medical field. So it works out very well that way. But what about sometimes there is equipment that we ran into this past week that nobody wants? And you can't just toss it into the dumpsters and throw it in the landfill. It's just, it's just not going to work. I mean, you you know, and I've seen people try and they try to get away with it. And next thing you know, you hit with a fine or something happens. So what you want to do is, you know, with some of this stuff, like the um, we had probably 10 or 15 tube type TVs. Uh, and if you're old enough to remember the tube type TVs, right? The one with the big tube in the back, the big uh, C, was it the CRT tube, cathode ray tube? And nobody wanted those. Uh, nobody wanted to buy those from us or nobody even wanted to take them. We wanted to give them away and nobody wanted those. So what do you do with that equipment? Well, there is, if you look around your community or your local area, I know we have two here in our local area, that once a month they do a, uh, a technology, um, basically, um, what do they call it? A pickup, technology pickup. And it's not so much of a pickup, though, because we had to deliver it. But it is a technology, uh, just uh, a day where you take your technology in. And they even help, you know, unload it from your cars. And they take tube type TVs. They take anything, any technology you want to get rid of, they take it. And they dispose of it the correct way. I know they strip all the stuff down. They remelt the plastics on it. They reuse almost every part of that technology. So that is a way you can get rid of it. Check your local community. Ask around. I'm sure you'll find somebody that's going to be able to help you out. Again, if you are a for-profit company um, and you're doing, let's say, a three-year refresh on your uh, computers, maybe. I mean, uh, like I said, I worked for a for-profit company for a while and they had laptops there that were 10 years old and they were still using them for, you know, million dollar sales. And I guess if it works for you, it works for you. But uh, if you refresh every three to five years, look at your local community, look for things like preschools, uh, day, daycare centers. Daycare centers are huge uh, with accepting donations, you know, stuff that works. You don't want to give them anything that's broken. Uh, you can also look at any shelters like women's shelters, even men's shelters. Uh, drug maybe, drug uh, rehab centers or shelters, uh, halfway houses. Those are the kind of places that would gladly accept your three- to five-year-old technology as long as it's working because they could use it. I know the rehab centers use it for job searches and different things, so it's really, really great. Um, and, hey, if you look at the end of this whole thing, it is a tax write-off for you anyway. So it works out very, very well. Uh, you're doing something for your local community uh, where your business is located. And you're doing something uh, for the environment because we're not throwing that in the landfill. And like I said, you're getting a, a little tax break back for yourself, which is very nice. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of companies that said, look, Jack, don't even worry about getting a tax paper. And we're not really worried about it. And, and they just let it go at that. So that does happen. So enough with that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a story from the trenches. I know uh, Mike Smith does a lot of these. And I really enjoy listening to how he gets involved in something and how he works his way back out of it. And I think that's key here. And I want to bring more of these to, to you guys on this particular podcast. And I feel that this week was just a great story uh, from the trenches, from my own experience. Uh, let's say from my eyes to your ears, right? And anyway, so this is what happened this week. So this week we've had a, well, we have a copier. Uh, copier, printer, scanner, you know, one of the big center main units. And it hasn't been allowing us to be able to scan to email using uh, using Google, right? Because we're a Google shop. I told you before, we use Google Suite. 
uh, throughout the school district. All of our emails handled by Google now. And that's fantastic. It works well. But when you're trying to, for whatever reason, when you're trying to set up these copier printer scanners and you're trying to set this up to scan the Gmail, for whatever reason, the IP or the VLAN that it was on would not allow it to do that. Uh, so I started looking into it and I thought, okay, we'll wait. I set another scanner printer copier, just, just you know, one of the desktop ones up. And I had it on a, a different VLAN. Um, we call it our office VLAN. So I have it on our office VLAN and it is working fine. It's scanning. It'll scan the email and go out through Gmail and get, you know, get sent right back to the user's inbox. It works absolutely flawlessly. So in all my wisdom, I took a day and I thought, today's the day I'm going to really get into this uh, situation. So first of all, what I did, I sat down, I logged into the printer. And if you've used any of these printers, today's modern day printers, folks, uh, you go through a web page and you configure the whole thing through a web page. So it's very, very easy to do this. Well, I went through and it was static to a, a 10 dot address. Well, I knew that our office VLAN is on the 192 uh, address base, right? So, or subnet. So what I did was I went in and I found an IP address. I pinged the IP address and there was no ping response. That's the first thing I could tell you to do is actually try to ping the IP address to see if that IP address is available. And I told you before, we talked about setting up DHCP. And when we set ours up, this particular subnet, we left uh, 0 through 10 not used. We started our subnet at dot .11. So I knew that 0 to 10 was available. So I used uh, a dot .2 address. And I pinged it, and there was no response. So that automatically tells me, fairly certain that it is not being used on my network. So I decided to go ahead and change the static IP address on that copier to the address that I was using. So what I noticed next is as soon as that printer, that copier rebooted, right, it restarted, the, uh, I no longer had communications with it. I could not talk to it. On the screen, for some reason, it says, I see, a, you know, I found a duplicate address on your network. Now, I don't know where it found that duplicate address because it was not being used. It, it could be, and sometimes I always tell people at work, you know, there, in our line of work, there's a lot of, it, I, I call it coincidental or coincidence. So there's a lot of coincidence that maybe somebody turned something on and it did have that address. Uh, by the time I went up front and started working on this copier, I don't know. But it, it's pretty, it's a far stretch that it was being used because it wasn't in the DHCP server. So it couldn't be handed out. Anyhow, <laughs> so I thought, what am I going to do now? I cannot communicate with this copier any longer on my network. So I thought, well, what I need to do is I'm going to go ahead and take a laptop up, right? Makes sense. Take a laptop up, and I'm going to plug a network cable between my laptop and that copier, put my laptop on the same IP or subnet range as that copier, and I should be able to talk to it. Well, here's the problem when connecting two devices together. And if you're sitting out there and you've done this before, you're going, Jack, I know what the answer is to that. And I get it. But we also are talking to the folks that maybe never tried this. When you're connecting two devices together, you need a crossover cable. Now, in most modern day switches today, it will automatically sense that you're connecting two ports together or two devices together and one side will automatically cross. That does happen. But when you're using two devices, such as a laptop and the copier, there's no automatic crossover feature. Well, I didn't have a crossover cable. So at times what I do is I tend to uh, want to step away. So I stepped away from it a little bit, went back to my office, grabbed another cup of coffee, sat down and started thinking, what can I do next? How can I communicate with that copier on the IP it's on because now I can't even log into the, and if you've ever used one of those, there's a touchpad on it. It wouldn't even allow me to get in the touchpad because it couldn't find our authentication server and it knew that if it couldn't find that just to lock itself out, which it did. So I could not get back into it. 
So the more I started thinking about it, um, I couldn't change it to DHCP. I couldn't really do anything to this copier. We were stuck. So after going back and having a half a cup of coffee, I started thinking a little bit about what could I do? Well, here's how I solved this issue, and this may help you in the future. I know all of our devices are plugged into a managed switch. This is where it's huge between managed and unmanaged switches. If it's managed, we have a lot more flexibility. Now, if you did not have a managed switch in this situation, I would suggest just plug a little, maybe a five port switch in between that copier and your laptop. That would work. Or as I said earlier, build a crossover cable and that would also work. But I knew I had it plugged in the managed switch. So I went to the port. Uh, I pro, you know, I went into my, uh, and I use, I do everything command line. I'm kind of old school that way uh, on my switches. I went into command line to the switch. I telneted to it or SSH'd into it and I looked at it and I said, let's change that VLAN from the port that it was on that was not working to, and I just created a test VLAN. And I called it that, test VLAN, for lack of a better uh, word for it. I typed in test VLAN. I gave it a VLAN number of 99 because I know that's not being used on my VLANs. And I created a new VLAN, a test VLAN. Once I did that, I opened up another port and I went to the switch closet at this point so I could plug my laptop into the switch. I went to another port and I set it to VLAN 99. And that's the beauty of a managed switch, is that we can have multiple networks running across one switch. So I wasn't interfering with any of the other networks that were running through that switch. Everything was just fine. It didn't even really know I was there. But what it allowed me to do was put my laptop on the proper subnet. I brought up a web page. You know, I typed in that printer's IP address and boom, it came right up. It was absolutely perfect. So sometimes you have to sit back and think, look at your connections, think about what gear you have and how that gear can get you out of trouble. Because this was, yeah, I was in what I like to call a pickle. <laughs> I was in a pickle because I wasn't able to uh, have anybody else printing or doing anything with that copier or they couldn't scan because I had it locked up tight. Now, it's one of those things, you know, where you're trying to make it better and you might make it worse. But anyway, I was able to get in there. I was able to go in. And then what I did, I decided I'm going to set that copier to DHCP. Because if I set it to DHCP, at least it's going to pull an available IP address from the DHCP server. And if I get everything working and printing and scanning properly, I'll go in and I'll just reserve it to that copier with its MAC address. It's not a big deal. That way I know it will never get handed out again. So I got, went ahead and I did that. I opened the web page up. I set it to DHCP and I got an IP from the server. And once again, I was able to go to my office, any workstation on the network, and I was able to talk to that copier with its new IP address. So everything was going rather well. So I went into, we have a print server set up. I don't know if you've ever seen it. The software is actually called PaperCut. Um, I don't think it's owned by, you know, well, it's owned by a company, but not by the reseller that we bought it from. And it's basically, it's a print management software is all it is. So I went to the, the print server and I right clicked on the printer and long, you know, lo and behold, I was not able to change the IP address on the port. So that threw me off. And I think, still looking back at it, I still, you know, I want to try this again. But looking back at it, I think it's because I wasn't logged in with the administrator account that originally set those printers up on there. I was logged in as myself. Even though I have admin privileges, it would not, everything was grayed out. It would not let me go in and change those, those, those port number to my new IP, which would have solved everything and we would have been okay. So anyway, I was able to go in. I had to go back in and reset up the static address back to the original IP address that it was. Then I went back and I had to re-VLAN out the port because I had all my office VLAN. And I had to re-VLAN it back out to my server, my static VLAN. And I did that. And then the printer was functioning again. Everybody was happy. And we had a great story today for you. But it just tells you when you're working with something and when you're digging into a project, don't ever let it get to the point where, 
let's just back up. Don't ever walk away from it. I've had techs before working for me that said, you know what? They would be out working with one of our customers. Now, our customers are, you know, we have many, many clients because we have many, many classrooms and teachers and staff and administration. All those folks we feel are our clients. And many times they would be out with a client. They would say, well, uh, I'll have to send Jack over. You know, that's not the answer. If you have somebody working for you and every time they get stuck, they have to send you in to fix the problem, you may not need the person uh, working for you. Now, on the other hand, don't get me wrong. If somebody's working for me and comes to me and says, Jack, how do I fix this? And we sit down and talk about it and I'm able to give them instruction enough where they can do it on their own. That's a win-win situation. That's fantastic. But don't ever tell don't ever tell people when somebody's working for me that oh Jack will come fix it. Well, if I have to go fix everything, um, eventually we did uh, let that guy go, and uh, because he wasn't being very efficient, he wasn't taking up you know fifty percent of the workload. He was just uh, basically giving me seventy five percent of the workload back, and he was doing little things like putting toner cartridges in. So it really didn't help me out. But uh, and he didn't want to learn, so that was the big thing. You know, you're you're going to have to learn. So don't let anything put you to the point where you know you're going to walk. You're just going to walk away totally from it, and never return to it. Also, learn from this. This was a huge learning experience for me because I said the best way to learn how to fix something is break it, and you know I broke it, and I had to reverse engineer what I was doing. Um, and one thing I've learned over the years is even, and I'm not for pencil and paper, believe me, but I always have a laptop with me. I always have my Evernote open, or if you have OneNote or whatever you're comfortable using, even even Microsoft Word, whatever you're comfortable using, take notes of what you're doing. Because in the world of networking, in the world of technology that we do, uh, there's no undo button. There's not a button that says go back, you know, like if I'm working on a photograph in in Photoshop and I get 12 layers down, I can say revert to the original picture. We can't do that in technology. You can't be working on a switch, setting up a firewall, doing all this stuff, and then you get to some point and something didn't work, you can't hit revert to 8 a.m. because it's just not available. So it's something to think about. Uh, so keep really, really good notes so you can work your way back up that stream to to where it did work and you can at least go back and revert everything back on your own manually to when it did work. So it was a great lesson for me. Uh, so as I said, never, never stop thinking or working on an issue. Uh, and most of all, always keep good notes of your process. So I got just a little bit here. We're going to call this shop talk. Now shop talk is going to be something uh, for you that uh, I have, because I told you, I still do consulting work. I still do uh, occasionally working on folks. Uh, people bring me computers and they drop them off and say, hey, Jack, can you fix this up? Can you make it run faster? And this is where my shop talk will come from. So today on shop talk, what we're talking about here, uh, as I said, I've had a long time customer. He called me, well, actually, he saved me, believe it or not, we were in a Walmart and uh, the gentleman, my one of my old customers here came running down through Walmart and said, Jack, Jack. And I said, yeah. I said, Hey, what's up? And you know, client's name. And, um, he said, didn't you hear me yelling for you back? I said, I didn't hear anything. I was just kind of walking with my wife, you know, and she was shopping and I was just kind of doing what husbands do, follow your wife around. And <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, I was trying to get, he said, Hey, do you still work on computers? And I said, well, absolutely. I still work on computers, you know, pretty much every day, all day. That's, that's my life. That's my living. Um, so he said, oh, great. He said, our computer's been running slow and it's been, you know, uh, kind of chugging along. And, you know, the story we get all the time. They think they ha it has some viruses on it. They're not sure. Um, and he just wanted to know if I would clean it up. And I said, sure, absolutely. So he said, well, when can I bring the computer over? And so I gave him my number. He gave me, we exchanged phone numbers. Um, he gave me a call the other day and he decided to, uh, bring the machine over. So I set up the I, I set up the computer, and as I was creating my uh, okay. So the first thing I did was, and I'm sure you do this with any client you work with, is I uh, I brought the computer in, and the first thing I noticed, and I don't know why I didn't remember this, but 
I booted the computer up and the operating system was Windows Vista. And I was like, oh no, man, why couldn't it be Windows 7? I know you didn't have Windows 10. Why couldn't it be Windows 7? But it is Windows Vista. So the first thing I did was, uh, before even this, I always start a new note for any client. Uh, obviously, I didn't have these notes way back when he first met me and when we first started working on his computers. But what I do in my notes is a few key items when you're working for clients. You know, write down what the uh, make and model of the computer is, how much RAM is in it, how much hard drive is in it, and at least a processor. And I also start, start the top of my note with the time, uh, the time I'm starting on this particular computer or project. Just that's for, this is all just stuff for me. Because when that client calls you back again four years from now, you're going to say, oh, okay, do you still have the Dell Optiplex or Dell Dimension? This happens to be a Dell Dimension uh, model number. And they're going to say, oh, no, 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 we bought a new computer. Or yeah, that's the same machine. I think what it does is it, it makes your client know or at least believe that you are more in touch with that client. Uh, using Evernote, it allows me to tag the notes so I can tag something with the client's name. So when they do call, if you need a quick refresher, you can just type you know, into a tag search, boom, bring that note up, and you can just be looking at it when you're talking to them on the phone. But the thing that I wanted to ask you out there, because I know a lot of you do consulting work uh, that listen to this show, a lot of you, you know, uh, work on other PCs and stuff at different times. Because the second thing I noticed was, and I didn't remember this from before, was it was running two gigabytes of RAM. Only two gigabytes. And I have no RAM. And I used to keep old RAM around. This is an older machine. But I have no RAM around that I can put in there. Because if you have something like that, you don't always have to charge your client for everything you do. If you have old computers, you strip them down or something, and you have old memory laying around, or maybe somebody needs a hard drive. You know, if you call your client and say, hey, I have a 250 gigabyte hard drive. Yes, it's not the biggest in the world but I can put it in and not charge you for that drive. You know, that's a nice thing to do. Not a business client. I'm talking a home user. Uh, It's just something nice you can do for the client. Uh, If you have a part laying around, you don't have to say, look, I got this part for free. I'll charge you $90 for it. No, we don't have to always do that. But I have no RAM laying around. And his total hard drive is a 230 gig hard drive. But my question to you is, do you work on older machines? And do you have an OS in mind that you will not take into your shop? So if somebody calls you, you know, I don't even know. You wouldn't say what version of OS do you have, obviously. But you may say, you know, when the computer turns on, when Windows is coming up, what's what's the window uh, name on there? So if they say it's, you know, Windows 8.1 or Vista um, or maybe even XP, Do you still work on it? Obviously, we're not going to do Windows 95 and 98, right? Those are gone. 2000, gone. Um, But what flavor of Windows or OS, what version of OS uh, will you not let in your shop? Or do you just let everything in your shop and you just deal with it? You know, that's the hardest thing. And uh, I just had this conversation with my wife this morning. We were talking about home users. Typically, if a home user buys a computer, and this machine is is older, obviously, it came with Windows Vista. When a home user buys a machine, they don't upgrade it as much as we do as technologists. Um, You know, I actually upgrade my computers, um, but I guess we're in the field. I guess that's the thing. So if you're not in the field, would you, if you're running Windows XP or Vista, and I'm sure there's still a lot of home users out there running Windows XP, I'm absolutely positive of it. Do you think, um, well, let me just back this up. They do not upgrade their their hardware as much as we would. They do not uh, buy new computers unless theirs gets hit by a lightning strike and it no longer works anymore. Uh, Some people um, do. At one time, we knew a gentleman that every time his computer slowed down, he just went out and bought a new one. Uh, He felt that it was getting old and slowing down. And, you know, honestly, that could be about... 20% 20% of it that we see in industry, you know, the other 80% of it is, it just needs cleaned up. 
Uh, even to the point when I used to run Windows computers at the house all the time, I would totally reformat them, totally wipe everything and reload Windows at least once a year. And that was just my way of doing it. Once a year, I would just wipe it all and reload it. Um, and that seemed to always help me out. And uh, even in the school, we do that now, right? So in a school situation, if we have major troubles with a, with one of the student computers and there's major things going on, being everything today is cloud-based storage, it makes it really easy. We hook it up to the network. You know, we hit the uh, boot from the NIC and we just re-image it. Uh, we're using SCCM. We talked about that before. We just re-image that hard drive and we send it back out to the student. They log in. It's just like getting a, a clean install. Well, it is a clean install. So it works out really, really, really well. So yeah, I'd just like to know that. So if you uh, either comment on the videos on YouTube or uh, send me an email or drop a comment um, on the uh, tips from the serve room under this this actual podcast episode, and let me know if you have a limitation of what comes into your shop. Well, folks, thank you so much for listening, downloading, and subscribing to the show. I truly do appreciate it. Uh, please remember, as always, use my Amazon link. If you go to tips from the server room, dot com you can go on there and if you buy anything from amazon just click that link and a couple pennies come back to the show which helps me to buy some new equipment that i'm looking at and um, it just it really does help out uh, for all the costs that we have here you know with the web hosting and everything and i'm sure you've heard all that before so but thank you very much for using that link i know a lot of you are and i hope you continue to do so also, I did set up a Patreon page because every other podcaster in the world has one. So I figured I don't want to be left out. So it's patreon.com slash Jack's Tech Corner. And it's also a link on the show notes. You can just click on that and uh, be able to do that. Do not forget the uh, server course, the Windows uh, 2012 R2 server course. That can be found at jtclearning.com. jtclearning.com. Uh, check it out. It's a great, you know, great course. I mean, it was all built by myself. And uh, I've had a lot of positive feedback. A lot of people said that they're actually uh, got their promotion at the you know, at work. They wanted to work with the servers um, or, you know, it's just a, a maybe a, a nice certificate because I do mail your certificate. So you take that certificate and you can actually uh, put that with your resume and it may just help uh, with your job portfolio. So thank you uh, once again, everybody. And until next week, I will talk to you uh, very soon. Take care, and I'll see you then. Bye for now.